Good evening. Oh, right. Lovely. What, uh, tell me, why the, the uh... Today I had a visitor. A visitor? Mm -hmm. We don't have visitors. I do. Oh, you don't? You've been shut away up here for ten years. The only visitors you get are Dr Mills and the girl who does your dusting and sneaks in the evening newspaper. Well, today I had a visitor. A visitor? Who? Can't you guess? No. Oh, yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes, you can. Oh, I can't. Was it a bailiff? Oh, no. You always bring in such horrible things. No. Today I had a lady caller. And that's a clip from Mrs. Larry and Son, and you heard Vanessa Redgrave and Tim Spall, who's with us in the studio. Hello, Tim. How are you? I'm good, Simon. How's yourself? I'm very good, thank you. And it's very nice to see you. It's been uh, it's been a few years. I think the last time I saw you, you'd been David Irving in that yeah. film Denial. The it's slightly film. different character. <laughs> slightly, yeah. a slightly different character. Yes, but in that in that clip that we just heard, it's quite a good clip actually because we get a glimpse of the relationship between. L.S. Larry and, and his mum, uh, just explain where we are with... The, I mean, obviously, we get the gist of it with Mrs. Larry and Son, which is a very revealing title. Indeed. Just, just explain the story that you're telling here. Well, basically, it's a, f a story that concentrates very much on the relationship, hence the uh, title of the film, the name of the film. And it's about how incredibly close and uh, some might use the term abusive from her to him the relationship was... He was, um, by profession, uh, his day job, as it were, was a rent collector, right from man, right to boy, to the point where he was retired. But also his other passion, obviously, and his, his drive and his compulsion was his art. But what he devoted a huge amount of his time to was being his mother's sole carer. She was an invalid and had been, more or less, from the point he was born. And he'd been preconditioned by her and trained to be enthralled to her every desire and need and requirement. So he was really did all of those things before that term carer mm. was used. And then in the evening he would go up to his attic in this two up, two down uh, uh, terrace house in Pendlebury and paint these great pictures. And uh, his mother, who he adored and did also everything for and really wanted a please of her paintings, never missed the opportunity to tell him how much she absolutely despised them. It's a difficult relationship to get a handle on. It's quite upsetting, actually, because it is so intense. Hmm. The, the period of, of Larry's life that we're covering in this story, he, he's sort of on the cusp of fame, isn't he? He is, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is in his 50s. He's 52 or something. So he'd been doing it for a long time and he hadn't had any success, a little bit of success, but hardly any. And what was going on in this is that he's terrified to tell her that he's actually got some interest from a London gallery because he knows that, in a sense, that she will be jealous, wary and put it down and some way dismiss it, which she does when this letter that she re he reads out to her is, uh, becomes um, public knowledge to her. He introduces it, assuming at once that she might be impressed she's not. And he then, he, he just carries on with his life and he keeps trying to broach to the subject why he does what he does and it's not to upset her and so forth. She's not really, really interested because the trouble is his paintings remind her of the condition that we come in, which she considers to be down in the world because they were... Originally in Victoria Park, her husband was a rent collector too, with lots of promise, didn't work out, ended up as a debtor. They had to move from this place into an industrial part of Manchester and all of the work that he does reminds her, constant, she considers rubbing it in her face yeah. where they've come. Not seeing, of course, that what he's doing is absolutely and completely original. Now, the inbuilt tragic comedy quality in this is that Lowry knew and was desperate to please her, but also knew that what he's doing in his art wasn't. So there was a real kind of... and But he was carried on by his compulsion and his artistic originality to pursue that, to pursue that to the very, very end. This is what I think makes him a far more interesting 
artist and what the quaintness we have about him, the sort of homey kind of, oh, isn't that sweet, is a fu- that I think that relationship is in those paintings, is in that fabric, in the... Every brick, as he says in it, every brick, every stroke, every every everything is me. All those paintings, to a larger or lesser degree, are self-portraiture of this kind of predicament so he's in. It's interesting that even though he wanted to please her, he painted the paintings that he knew she would hate. I think he was compelled to do that because this is the this is the real strain i think this is the this is the dilemma he's in and this is the dilemma she's in because he knows she knows that he is in thrall to her every wish and in a sense i perceive also a kind of very very dog what he ex, what he does in, inherit from her is her stubbornness and this privacy this compulsion this private compulsion going on to to, to follow this epiphany he had because when they moved to this area he was just as oppressed by this area. He didn't like it. She was because he was brought up to feel that he was middle class. Uh, our middle class actually were is another matter. She wanted to be a concert pianist and was a good pianist, evidently. But one day he missed a train and he walked around the area on, a, on somewhere else to collect rent. He walked around the area and he had an epiphany and he saw something in the buildings, something in the environment that nobody else had seen and was compelled to get it down. Now, that, to me, adds up to the fact that he saw a bleak beauty in them, which I think is in those paintings. And also, it kind of related to his isolated own spirit and his isolated uh, relationship with his mother in an old way, this closeness and this isolation, loneliness. But whatever it was, it came together and it's in those paintings. Mm. And the people... People always go on about the matchstick men and so on and so on. I don't see matchstick men in them, but what I do see is individuals en masse at times going through, being, in a sense, um, servants to these huge buildings that are around them, you know. Uh, and also, he um, um, another thing that people don't realise is that they were composites. They weren't just representational. He would sketch buildings and then take these up to his attic in his studio and then invent them. And through that process, via his imagination, I think this emotional pull and tension between him and his mother and this um, dilemma he's in, is in that work. Is it, is it her shame that is driving her, you know, her unpleasant... I mean, she's a monster uh, many times in the exchanges with her son. Is it the, the shame of the past that is driving that? I think so. I think also, uh, evidently, she had a very difficult birth. He's an only child. He never had an intimate relationship with anybody else, and I think she kind of liked that because it meant he was in thought to her more. Uh, plus, she was a thoughted artist herself, and I think she found him a bit, from day one, a bit of an encumbrance <laughs> and a bit of an embarrassment. And often people do bite the hand that feeds them. She trained him up to look after him, which he did. And not only out of duty, but out of a sense of incredible love, because as far as we know, nobody else infiltrated that intimacy. There was nobody comparable. There wasn't a wife to take him away, to put that in perspective. There wasn't a, a close relationship with a man, woman. Later, he had many, many friends, dear friends, and he was a very humorous, charming, affable guy. And I think there are exchanges in this. There are often very funny moments, mm-hmm. and it's sometimes how outrageously cruel she could be about his work. But also they do have a bit of cut and thrust, a bit of fun. But I think as painful as that relationship is, it was the only one he knew, so therefore it was an ongoing natural condition that wasn't always painful to him. He grew up with it, that's what it was, and when she died, he missed her horribly. And that's one of the reasons he says why he turned down an OBE, CBE and a knighthood, because once she'd gone, it didn't matter. One of the funniest exchanges, I think, actually reminded me of talking to Mark, who, as you know, is in Shetland, yeah. uh, where you were last year. Indeed. Uh, for the Shetland Festival. And when you say to Mark, are you happy? He'll say, I haven't been happy since Nixon resigned. That's what he always <laughs> says that. <laughs> There's a line uh, in this film where Vanessa Redgrave says she hasn't been happy since 1868. Yes, it's true. <laughs> so, there you go. That's a Kermode line. Well, well, there you go. I mean, this is the quality. I mean... You know, she hasn't been out of that room no. since 1900 or something, you know. I mean, so... You so know, she's been miserable a long time. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, this relationship between the ill and the carer, 
Um, obviously, there's some glorious ones, but I bet there's a lot more examples of this unromantic uh, ingratitude, this um, thing that goes on, or this annoyance about being so dependent on somebody, which you've actually, you know, you're the victim of your own invention. Mm. As it were. I mean, but what you've got to know about, what once you learn that Lowry was, as a small boy, uh, was actually encouraged to follow her around with a small stool in case she swooned in one of her swooning moments. Um, so anybody who's been preconditioned to do that is going to be know the mood's going to know the mood swing, going to know everything's going to know. But interestingly enough, that that clip that you show, when she finds she's got a new friend, he's slightly jealous as well. Yeah. He's a little bit perturbed by this. So it's a two-way thing as well. And she says jealous, yeah. yeah, yeah. When, as a man who has painted, when you played, I think I remember this right, when you played Turner, you learned to paint, you painted for two years before, I did, and you got pretty good. Was was all your, right? I'm all right. <laughs> was your well, yeah? Well, you're not a Turner or a Lowry. No, yet, not, no, I'm certainly not. So, how mm. did you approach this? How did you how did you prep for being for being Lowry? Well, I went up there for a start, and I unannounced, and I stood in front of the paintings for hours and looked at them and just studied them, studied them, and now I started to see, having read the script, which just I was a, a, incredibly touched by it. And see more and more in them because I think you know that the dissemination of his work uh, through merchandising and so forth and this coziness has given us the same way we think that Dickens is cozy. It's not, you know, you read Dickens properly; it's pretty hard and pretty d dark, you know. And I think once you look at those paintings, you start getting an idea. But funny enough, I hadn't painted for quite a long time, but as soon as I started shooting that, I couldn't stop. I always carried my watercolour, the little palette, but I constantly painted and painted and painted. I would come off the set, I was painting, I was knocking off. I'd knocked off a few turners, but I was knocking <laughs> off Lowry's and then I started to paint, all sort, do all sorts of stuff, you know. And then I stopped after we finished and then I carried on afterwards. And then I, with the influence of these two geniuses, somewhere along the line, some of the, they've got in their wisdom, kindness or madness, They've framed up 14 of the paintings I've done recently. And then in the Lowry, one of them is next to the original. So, oh. I mean, I don't know how quite on a note to take that, but it's liberated that side of my... Are your, turn, are your yeah. Turners better than your Lowry's, your knockoff? So is your Lowry better than your Turners? Mm -hmm. Turner was a technically, uh, you know, such a brilliant... He was a man of that period, so he'd been, you know, he was a classically, classically trained painter with a lot of... Lowry is a different type of painter, but I don't know. I've got a, a thing on my wall that I look at, I can't remember doing, which is like a Turner copy. And then I look at the, I never quite know how I've done it anyway. So it's a bit like the acting, but <laughs> you know, get on with it. You think about it at the time, and there it is. It's done. And as he says, the painting is there. People will make of it for what it is, or not, as the case may be. It's the same way of every performance you do. Do you, do you ever get nervous about acting with someone like Vanessa Redgrave. Is there a sort of, I don't know how well you knew her beforehand, but she, you've been around many decades, but her reputation yeah. goes goes before. I mean, was it was it an easy relationship? Was was there any part of you that went, blimey, I better be on the top of my game here? Well, I always am intrigued about that. I mean, I've immense respect for her. I've been a fan of her work and I'm a huge fan of her father's as well, you know. Um, so she's from a lineage there. That, and I, But I knew her daughters. Uh, uh, God rest her soul, Natasha, delightful person, as is Jolie, both fantastic actresses. So, and I'd met her occasionally, but just in various sort of showbiz things that you do. But I'm always not nervous, but I'm always conscious of that what we're involved in is a collaboration. And the thing is about Vanessa is she's she's been around as long as she has, and she is of her age, but she's still incredibly determined to do it on her own terms and there and then and create something right there as a, she doesn't come with a, you know, with a, with a, with a way of doing it. We would discover it together, you know. If right. there's a Banksy movie, would you be up for doing that? Uh, not much. We don't know anything about him. I would like to know <laughs> a little bit about him. <laughs> um, Tim, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. What do we oh. see you in after, after Mrs. Larry and Sam? What's next for you? Uh, I don't know if there's anything, everything I've done really is coming up. I'm about to start this movie I hope it's an independent movie called the the obscure tale of the Grand Duke of Corsica, the last Duke of Corsica, 
and then I'm going to do another thing. Uh, it's like a 77 bus. You wait long, and then to a, a film called The Last Bus uh, directly after it. So if we get them made and they get out, maybe 11 people who see them might even enjoy them. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> uh, Tim Spall, thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Simon. Nice to talk to you.